we start today's virtual exploration in Shropshire at Cumbermere Abbey, then on to Ross Uhaf in Flintshire and Highton in Lancashire, then further north to Lancaster and our last two sites are on the Isle of Man at Douglas and Ronald's Way. In 1919, Sir Kenneth Crossley, Baronet, bought Cumbermere Abbey in Shropshire. His father was Sir William Crossley, who with his brother Frank had set up the Crossley Brothers Gas and Oil Engine Company in Manchester in the 1860s. In 1904, they'd set up Crossley Motors, an offshoot specifically for building vehicles, and by 1911, Sir Kenneth was chairman of both companies. During the First World War, Crossley supplied over 6,000 vehicles to the Army and Royal Flying Corps, mainly staff cars, ambulances and tenders. They also built over 400 de Havilland DH-9 and DH-10 bombers for the Royal Flying Corps. After the war, they built the Willys Overland car, an American car, under licence, and also the Crossley Cagress half-track lorry for the British Army. They also obtained a license to build the Bugatti Model 23, but only 25 of these cars were produced. They also built 25 cars known as the Crossley Streamline. These were built under license from Sir Deniston Burney, who had been the chairman of the Airship Guarantee Company. The Airship Guarantee Company, part of Vickers, had built the R100 airship at Howden in Yorkshire in the late 1920s. In 1931, Sir Kenneth Crossley learned to fly at Woodford, near Manchester. He bought himself a gypsy moth and set up a landing ground just east of the abbey, where he also had a small tin shed for the folded moth to live in. His daughter, Fidelia, also learnt to fly in the moth, and having gained some experience, bought herself a brand new Compa Swift from nearby Hooton Park. In 1936, Sir Kenneth bought himself a brand new de Havilland Hornet Moth. As of 2023, this aircraft is still flying. In 1940, Fidelia Crossley joined the Air Transport Auxiliary and in the next two years flew all manner of aircraft, including the short Stirling bomber. In August 1939, Sir Kenneth's only son, Anthony Crossley, was killed in the crash of this Lockheed Electra near Copenhagen in Denmark. The landing ground didn't reopen after the Second World War and has now returned to farmland. Sir Kenneth died in 1957, but Cumbermere Abbey remains within the Crossley family. The hangar, once home to the Gypsy Moth, Compass Swift and Hornet Moth, remains in the corner of the field and can be seen from the adjacent road. The landing ground at Ross Uhaf belonged to Mr. Claude Hunter. Claude Hunter was the managing director of James Hunter Limited of Chester. Originally seed merchants, the company had progressed to building aerodromes for public and private owners alike. Doubtless, constructing the airfield at Ross Uhaf had provided lots of practical experience in constructing an aerodrome as it was built from several smaller fields. In the early 1930s, Sir Alan Cobham was campaigning for a program of aerodrome building throughout the British Isles. Claude Hunter and Sir Alan Cobham knew each other well, and it was probably that friendship that brought the National Aviation Day display to Ross Uhaf on the 16th of July, 1933. Contemporary reports suggest there were more sheep than spectators that day. Not that it really mattered. The previous display had been at Oswestry, and the next display was going to be on the Wirral, so a small diversion to the landing ground was of little cost or consequence. Claude Hunter did own three aircraft at various times, a Clem L25, an Avro Avian, and this delightful Robinson Red Wing, which still survives. The 
the landing ground closed in late 1939 and never reopened. During the First World War, Hubert Butler was an officer in the Royal Flying Corps. In 1926, he bought a house on Victoria Road, Highton Hill, and opened a prep school. He also bought 25 acres of land to the north of Victoria Road. This was to be used for playing fields and an aerodrome, which officially opened in 1932. William Forbes Sempill, also known as the Master of Sempill, was a well-known pilot at the time and officiated at the opening ceremony in 1932. The aerodrome was understandably quite popular with the boys and at least one boy got to fly home for the holidays. Mr Butler and the prep school moved to Cumbria at the outbreak of the Second World War and the site is now occupied by a secondary school. The 1938 AA Landing Grounds Guide included the landing site at Scale Hall Farm near Lancaster. Never a very large field, it was first used in 1912 when Robert Slack landed his Blériot there. Another early visitor was Mr Bentfield Hux, the first Briton to loop an aircraft and inventor of the Hux starter, much used in the First World War and beyond. During the First World War, the Royal Flying Corps put up a Bessonneau hangar. The airfield wasn't a Royal Flying Corps airfield, but it was useful when ferrying aircraft. The airfield didn't see a great deal of use after the First World War, as joyriders preferred to fly off the vast sandy beach at Morecambe Bay. The National Aviation Day displays did use the site on several occasions. Sir Alan Cobham, always careful with money, would have hated to have given a free display to the people on the beach at Morecambe. In the mid-1930s, construction of a new road from Haysham to Lancaster, just to the east of the landing ground, made the site even smaller. The landing ground closed in 1939. Cunningham's Holiday Camp in Douglas was opened by Joseph and Elizabeth Cunningham in 1904. It was used as an internment camp for enemy aliens during the First World War, but reopened in 1919. The Cunningham's son, Willie, was the first man on the Isle of Man to own an aircraft. He kept it at Ronald's Way, but I haven't been able to find out what it was. He used a landing ground at the northwest corner of the camp. It was in use until the Second World War. The first aircraft to land at Ronald's Way was this Hanley Page Hampstead in 1928, followed shortly thereafter by Sir Alan Cobham and his de Havilland giant moth. By the early 1930s, regular airline flights were operating from the field, operated by West Coast Air Services, Aer Lingus and Railway Air Services.
At the outbreak of the Second World War, Ronalds Way Airport was handed over to the RAF. It was mainly used by Westland Wallaces, towing drogue targets for the ground defence and gunnery school nearby. In 1943, the RAF handed the airfield over to the Admiralty, who promptly closed it and built four new runways, reopening in 1944 as a training school for the Barracuda torpedo bomber. After the war, ownership reverted to the Isle of Man government. A short walk from the airport terminal building takes one to Ronalds Way Halt, a request stop on the railway from Douglas to Port Erin. How splendid! Thanks for watching.